Jason Commander Show podcast coming at you immediately after the Super Bowl. We are we have jumped right into the studio. Super Bowl is over. It ended 25 minutes ago, maybe. And we're jumping in here. We're going to recap the Super Bowl. We're going to recap the entire game. We're going to talk about the halftime show. We're going to talk about some of the commercials. And we're going to break down the highlights of the controversial catches with Zach Ertz and Corey Clement that were reviewed, the touchdowns. And we're going to see exactly if they made the right calls. I believe they got one call wrong and one call right. So we'll see which ones those are. Thank you for joining me here, whether you're listening to it the night of the Super Bowl or the day before. What a game. What a game. Uh, We've been treated to two incredibly entertaining Super Bowls the past two years. Uh, With, of course, the 28-3 comeback from the Patriots against the Falcons last year. And then this. This, I mean, this was a, this was like a Madden game. You know, this was like a video game type numbers. The most yards in a single game combined by the two teams in NFL history, regular season, postseason, Super Bowl, doesn't matter. We've never seen this many yards in one game. And it was electrifying. I mean, it's, it was a great game. Fantastic game. It was, a, it was an interesting game. I think there was a lot of really, really weird calls made at times. Uh, I think Doug Peterson knew that he had to keep the pressure on the Patriots. He couldn't a lot of the times a lot of the times when teams play the Patriots, they mess up because they they're afraid of the Patriots, right? They they, they expect the worst. They expect Tom Brady to do things. They expect Bill Belichick to outsmart the coaches. So they kinda they get out of their element and they, they let the Patriots dictate what's going on in the game. Doug Peterson did not do that. I mean, he went through forward on fourth down a few times. Big situations. When it was 32-33, when, when the Eagles were losing, you know, the, before the Zach Ertz touchdown reception, there was a fourth and one. where that's a, that's a real decision. It's like, well, if you don't get it here, you know, he, he decide, and he doesn't even run it. He throws it with Nick Foles. So there was a lot to, and then, of course, the fourth and one, which will probably be one of those plays in Super Bowl history that, you see a million times. It's like the onside kick with the Saints. Uh, this is right around that same thing. I think what Peterson did with, with the with the fourth and one call, the play call was unbelievable. You know, the Nick Foles, the, the give him an Oscar, give Nick Foles an Oscar. He under center goes over, is talking to his lineman. Next thing you know, they snap it, then they reverse it, then they throw it back to Foles. Incredible play. Incredible play. I don't want to get ahead of myself though. I'm excited. I'm ramped up. Just watched the game, just got it to the studios, and I said, you know what, let's jump right in here and get involved with, with this game. But the, see, the NFL season's over. Very sad, very sad. And I don't think anybody really thought Philadelphia would be that good this year. And I, don't, I didn't hear anybody saying they were going to win the Super Bowl. Philadelphia, this game was weird because Philadelphia was being portrayed as this huge underdog but they were only a four-point dog like that's not that's not much at all really the Giants when they played New England were like seven-point dogs that was a much bigger upset it wasn't much it wasn't as big of an upset as people thought it was people thought it was an upset people put the Eagles as an underdog because of Nick Foles and Peterson versus Belichick and Brady that when you look at it like that I think that's where people were like, oh, wow, the Eagles are going to get blown out. But obviously Vegas didn't think that. I mean, the Eagles annihilated Minnesota, annihilated Minnesota. And New England was lucky to get away with a win in Jacksonville or against Jacksonville. If Jacksonville would have had a quarterback that was even relatively good, they probably would have beat New England. New England was vulnerable this year. This was a year where New England was vulnerable, but the AFC was terrible. So they kind of, you know, the New England Patriots, as long as they have Tom Brady, the best quarterback to ever live, they're going to be good. You know, they're not going to lose 10 games. So when the AFC is also bad, then that turns into a cakewalk for the Patriots. So I think everyone knew the Patriots were vulnerable to teams, especially teams that can spread the ball out and throw the ball around. And that's what Philadelphia does. Jacksonville could have beat New England, but they just weren't that kind of team that throws it around. So they had to revert back to running it, and that's why New England won that game. Philadelphia never stopped throwing it, never stopped spreading it out, never stopped hitting the Patriots from everywhere, whether it was reverses or sweeps or passing, long balls, screens, 
runs. I mean, they were everywhere. And you could see the Patriots were on the back foot for most of the game, almost the entirety of the game. And that was the real big thing to take away from this one was that Philadelphia dictated the pace. They dictated how the game was going to go. They didn't let the Patriots do that, which was, I mean, obviously worked. And Nick Foles, man, it's such a crazy story. It's such a crazy story. Nick Foles, a backup quarterback a few years ago, contemplating retirement after a terrible season in St. Louis, comes back, gets, you know, backup role to Carson Wentz, obvious franchise quarterback. Wentz goes down. Foles steps in, plays out of his mind, and is a Super Bowl MVP, beats Tom Brady. Sports are crazy. Sports, sports, I mean, I, I know, you know, I know most of y'all are worried about the if the Notre Dame Fighting Irish mascot is racist or not, ESPN. But this is what sports is all about. Moments like this, storylines like this. Um, the big con- the big talking point now is what the Eagles will do next year with Nick Foles and Carson Wentz. And I was saying this when when Minnesota and Philly were playing. Whenever Philadelphia beat Minnesota, I was saying, you know, what if Nick Foles goes and do does this? Do you do you just bench him? Do you just say, hey man, I know you just won the Super Bowl, I know you just beat Tom Brady and the Patriots, and you dominated Minnesota, the best defense in the league. You're obviously good enough to do this, but we're going to bench you for this guy who hasn't done it. It's it's kind of a weird situation because people the 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 obvious decision is well, Wentz is your franchise guy. Wentz is the franchise quarterback, so you got to play your franchise quarterback. He's the young guy. He's he's the, he you know, he's the guy that the future is is in. Play him. But I just don't know how you go away from the guy who just won you the Super Bowl. It's like the Bledsoe Brady thing. Like yeah, Bledsoe's the the you know Bledsoe's your guy, but Tom Brady just won you the Super Bowl, so go with Brady. If I was the Eagles, and Doug Peterson knows this way more than I do, you know, I mean. He, I'm speaking from a million miles away, just try, just trying to put myself in their position of, you know, judging their talent levels. But if you think Nick Foles can do this, can repeat this, can replicate this, and it's not like he's only played for three games. I mean, this guy has played, you know, whatever, whatever eight seasons in the, in the NFL, and he's had a really good season at Philadelphia before, when before he got traded. If you think Nick Foles can replicate this for two seasons, three seasons, and you can get a massive haul for a trade with Carson Wentz, you may have to do it. You may do it. Now, now on the flip side, if you think that the two quarterbacks are equal or Wentz is even better, then obviously, you know, obviously you you, you trade Foles. But it's just such a hard decision to go with a quarterback who's never won it. I mean, Wentz hasn't even won a playoff game. You know, yeah, he won. He won regular season games, but what if what if next season they go with Wentz and Wentz gets into the playoffs, throws five interceptions or something, and they lose? Well, then all of a sudden you're thinking, well, damn. We were here last year, and the the quarterback that took us to the Super Bowl, we got rid of for this guy. You know, I mean, let me know in the comments below. Or on Twitter or whatever, however you're ingesting this podcast slash vodcast. Let me know what you would do. If you would go with Foles or if you would go with Wentz. I, I'm pretty split. I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty split on this one. I, I can see both sides. Like I can I can understand why you would go with Carson Wentz. I can understand you've sunk a lot of draft picks into him. He's, he's obviously the fan- franchise guy. He's young. He's really good. He probably could have been the MVP this year if he doesn't get hurt. The Eagles were good with him. I totally get that. But I also get the argument of, hey man, this guy just won a Super Bowl. Like this guy is playing at a really high level. Obviously, the team and him click. Like obviously, there are. I mean, it's not like he 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 didn't walk through this win. You know, New England came back. New England was winning in the second half. They were they were winning the game. It, it was one of those moments where it was like, okay, well, New England's going to win this, and then Philadelphia went and got it. You know, Foles had to orchestrate a bunch of fourth down conversions he had to he had to throw deep balls he had to do a lot Nick Foles won this game it wasn't one of those well you know he was on the back of a great defense it was a 10 to 3 game 
whatever. He was a game manager. He had to go out there and duel Tom Brady, go one-on-one with Tom Brady. And he won, you know? So there's a lot of teams. I do think Foles, the one thing I'll say with Foles is that I do think he's kind of a system guy. I do think he he's not necessarily going to go turn your franchise around, whereas let's say like Aaron Rodgers, if he goes to any team, he's going to be good. He's Aaron Rodgers. Tom Brady, if he, if he goes to any team, he's going to be good. Foles, I believe, has to go to a team that is set up for him to win, like the Eagles. It is set up in a system that fits him, where he can play, where he's comfortable. Uh, I don't think, like, if you trade him to Jacksonville, I don't think he's, he's the guy that's going to lead any franchise. Now, if I'm a team that you know, runs a system like Philadelphia or wants to run a system like Philadelphia but doesn't have, but doesn't have the quarterback, then I'm going for Nick Foles. You know, like, like Washington, for example, when they got rid of Kirk Cousins, or they're you know, moving away from Kirk Cousins, obviously, they've traded for Alex Smith. They want to kind of do what Philadelphia does. So that's one of those things where Foles could fit in. And there's a, I mean, a Super Bowl winning, winning the Super Bowl gives you a lot of equity. Now, you, I mean, look at Joe Flacco. You know, Joe Flacco is no stud, but he's got a Super Bowl win, so people kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. They believe that he can do it again. They know that he's done it once, so maybe he can do it again. Uh, right now, I would say Nick Foles is probably... He's definitely a starter in the NFL. I don't know how many teams he would start for, which is hard to say since he's just won the Super Bowl. It's crazy to think, like... He's on, he's on arguably the best team in the NFL. He's starting for that team, but I don't know if he would start for any other teams. Like, I don't think he would start over, over Ben Roethlisberger, right? I don't think he would start over Phillip Rivers. I don't think he would start over Aaron Rodgers. You know, so it's one of those things where you, it, it, it's a tough— Nick Foles is a really tough player to judge because he does have a good track record of being able to do this, but it's just— in what capacity, with what team, and how long. But I don't want to get stuck too much on Nick Foles. We've got a lot to break down in a relatively short period of time. So we're going to go ahead. Let's let's go straight to let's go straight to the, the plays, the the controversial plays. If you are listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or Audio Mac, go to YouTube, search James Scrametta, S K R M E T T A, and we'll, we're doing like a picture in picture type thing where I am breaking down these plays and seeing if it was a catch, if it wasn't a catch, and explaining why they made the rules and explaining why I think the call should have been either different or the same. So let's go right into this. Let's let's jump right into a little picture-in-picture here. So the first play we're going to look for is the Corey Clement touchdown pass in the third quarter, or the touchdown reception in the third quarter. Now, let's go ahead and bring it up. All right, so we're up here. Let's start it. So Foles... They're on the 23. It's just it's just a good old-fashioned go route from Clement. Foles drops it in there. Great pass. Great pass, great catch, all that fun stuff. Now, right here, the Patriot players are signaling no catch, no moss. And I'm, I'm a, I was a little confused because I'm thinking, well, hold on a second. I mean, he's obviously in, in, the, he's obviously in the end zone. He has the ball, so it's got to be a catch. But if we go back to the replay and we watch this angle right here, you can see, I'm going to pause it at the like 32 second mark. Right here, he's, he's got a foot down, but he's bobbling the ball. The ball is all over the place, right? It's, it's in his hands. He's shifting hands. This possession is the first thing you got to look for in a catch. That is the most important thing to look for in a catch is possession. So at the 32 second mark to the 30... Five second mark is how long he was kind of floating through the end zone. If you go to the 30, like right after the 34, where I have it paused, right after the 34 second mark, that ball is moving. The ball is obviously, we're going to keep playing it back and forth over and over here, kind of in slow motion, but that ball is moving all in his arms. Yes, it's in his body. Like, yes, it's, it's here, but he's still juggling it. He's still kind of bumbling it around. That is not possession at all. So when he comes down with it at the 36-second mark, when he's out of bounds, that's when he fully first has possession, in my opinion. Because the ball is the ball is obviously moving. If you go from the 32-second mark 
to the 34 second mark. The ball is in the air in his left arm. The ball kind of floats down to his hand. You can see an obvious separation between his hand and the ball. And I have it paused at the 34 second mark where there is separation. And I'm telling you all the time so that if y'all go look at the video separately from me, then you can kind of follow along if you're listening to this on audio. This is not a catch. I don't understand how it can be a catch. His, he's out of bounds, and the ball is in the air. This image alone should be enough to display that it's not, it's not a catch, right? Because this guy, the ball, there's too much movement. The ball isn't rolling around, I suppose, but it's still in the air, like transitioning, like all in his arms, and he's out of bounds. So I don't see how this is a catch. And in this angle here at the 38 second mark, you can see it again, right? So he's moving the ball around, ball's transitioning. He gets up, he, and then the foot isn't even down. The third step, because at the 41 second mark, he's still kind of coming down with the ball. And he doesn't have possession yet. So he, the, the third step is out of bounds anyways. And then as he's falling out of bounds, the ball's rolling all over the place. Uh, th to me, this is not a catch. They ruled it a catch. To me, this is not a catch at all. And if we go to the 49 second mark and the 50 second mark, you can see kind of from the back, if you watch his left arm, watch the ball moving around as he's falling out of bounds. As he's falling out of bounds, the ball, you can see it at the 52 second mark, there is a gap between his hand and the ball. And he is out of bounds. You can't do that. The ball cannot be bobbled, cannot be moving. You have to have possession. Way before this moment, way before this 52-second clip here where his knees are out of bounds and the ball is still floating around. This is not a catch. And they reviewed this. You know, I mean, Every touchdown is reviewed. They reviewed this, and they said it was a touchdown. I, I, I just don't see it. You know, It's close, but from what I understand of the catches and the catch rule, this is not a catch. You can see it clear as day at the 52 second mark. The ball is moving in his hand. It moves from 52 to 53 as he's hitting the ground. The second his left wrist hits the ground, you can see the ball shifting because he's, he never truly had possession. So this to me was a blown call. Was a blown call. I mean, I don't, I don't know, because I feel like I have a really good grasp on the catch rules and, and targeting rules and stuff like that. But this one, this one I think they missed. Now let's go, now let's go to the Zach Ertz, the, the go-ahead touchdown. This one, we're going to start it at, um, so we'll let it play through how, how it was. We're going to start at the 44-second mark. And I'll have, I'll have links to these videos in the description of the YouTube video. So... Third and seven. Now, here's the situation. Here, here's So, third and seven, they're running basically a slant, man coverage, slant on, with Ertz on the outside. We're going to play it at the 44-second mark, hit play. So, the cornerback falls down, right? Cornerback falls down, makes contact with Ertz, makes contact with Ertz, and Ertz leaps into the end zone. When he hits the end zone, though, the ball kind of pops up. All right, so this is another one where we have to go picture in picture. We have to do this, break this down here. So we're going to start it at, at the, uh, we're going to talk about it here at the 105 mark. So Ertz has the ball on the six yard line. He, that's, where he makes, that's where he makes his catch, the six yard line. So it's, it's easy to be like, okay, well, he's caught it on the six, so he has to have had possession if he gets all the way to the end zone, right? Six yards. He takes two steps, all that stuff. All that stuff. The rule is you have to catch the ball through the ground, right? So if Ertz, the, the, what comes into play is at, at the 106 mark, whenever the cornerback makes contact with Ertz's legs. So at this point, they have to decide if Zach Ertz jumps into the end zone, if he leaps into the end zone as a runner, or if his natural catch is bringing him to the ground. If his catch, if his reception on the six, when he turns and runs, if he's 
catching and naturally falling forward, then that is part of the reception. The falling forward becomes part of the reception that he has to finish. Finish, in this situation, is when he goes in the end zone and the ball pops up. The ball popping up is not finishing. This is an incomplete pass if you believe that he is naturally falling forward with the reception and that he's not leaping into the end zone. So we're going to let it play at the 108 mark. So at the 111 mark, you can see it from a really good angle. So they make contact. They make contact. And it looks like he, he leaped. It looks like he, he kicks off that right foot and he pushes into the end zone. It looks like his natural running, his, his natural reception and running movement was not taking him off of his feet forward into, into this like diving pattern right here. So the touchdown happens when it crosses the plane at this point, if you believe he's a runner and that he's making a football move diving into the end zone. Then it's a touchdown as soon as he breaks the plane. And I think this was the right call. I think this was the right call. I do think at this point he was a runner. I think if you watch it, it's obvious that he doesn't, that he's not falling forward, but he's leaping forward. He's already made the catch. He's made the turn. He's taken a couple steps. There is contact with the, with the cornerback, and as the contact's bringing him down, he leaps forward. So this, and so this is not part of the reception. And I think that's where there's some confusion, right? Because the, the breaking the plane. That doesn't matter when if, if the catch or if the, if the leap is not a leap but a part of the reception. And the catch rule is super confusing. So, I mean, it does sound weird to say it. It's a lot of – it's all over the place. But I think they got this one right because I think Zach Ertz did have possession and was making a football move of leaping. You can see it again at the 11-second, 12-second like mark where he pushes off that right foot, leaps to the end zone, and the ball comes out. So when the ball comes out, it's already past the plane, it's already a touchdown, all good. And it was really close. You know, this, this is a really tough call because it all depends on, that, on where you believe he became a runner or if you believe he became a runner. And the way that his body is moving – it, it does look like he could be kind of leaning forward, lunging forward, falling forward. And if you watch it over and over again, you can kind of see both sides where now we're at the 24, 23 second mark. If you go to the 23 second mark and start it, Ertz is leaning forward, right? He, he, his whole body is leaning forward. I think he still had control of himself, which is why this ended up being a catch because he wasn't recklessly falling forward through the catching motion. And so the refs deemed this a catch. And I believe I think it was the right call. Obviously, if you're a New England fan, you're going to think opposite of this. If, if you're a Philly fan, you know, you're going to agree with the call. I get it. I understand all that. But I'm just, break, I'm just telling you from how I understand the catch rules there that why it's not a catch. Well, let's pull up the Jesse James catch. Let's pull up the Jesse. Let's compare because people, people are comparing those two catches. The Steelers catch, which got overturned. So we're going to go ahead and break that down and look at this right now. All right, so we're going to start this. We're going to start this video at the 27 second mark. So Jesse James catches this ball, falling, reaching in the end zone, it hits and he bobbles it and it ends up getting overturned. This is this is the difference in him and Zach Ertz is that Jesse James is falling as he catches it. So he has to finish the catch through the ground. His natural receiving motion is falling in this situation. Ertz jumped. So if Jesse James were to have caught this ball, turn, and then jump towards the end zone, then he it's not the natural motion is falling. At that point, the natural motion is standing still catching the ball. So that's where the difference in the two plays are. Uh, I think people, people are comparing them, but I think they're very different. You can tell that Jesse James... In order to make the catch, he, he was falling, right? He had to kind of leap to, to catch the ball, and he was falling. And that part of the reception is to finish. So that's the catch rule. And the catch rule can be confusing. I understand that. But I think, th hopefully, 
this kind of breakdown explains it because it's not it's not that confusing if once you understand kind of what the referees are looking at. And yeah, I think some of the rule, some of the catch rules are bad. I do think that you know sometimes that it's an obvious catch, but because of the rule, it's not. So this is one of those situations where, like with the Irks thing, it's it's easy to see it and go, well, it's obviously a catch. Well, it's not obviously a catch because it, it's much more complex than that. You know, just because he was six yards out, or just because he took two steps, or just because he broke the plane, doesn't make it a touchdown anymore. And if Ertz, if Ertz would have been hit earlier, and I think if, if during his catching motion he was falling, then this is definitely overturned, and we all understand that. You know, so that, but this that was a huge, 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 huge moment in the game. Obviously, it won the Eagles the game, and it's good to see that the refs I think made the right call. And I wish I, I would like to get more of an explanation on the uh, Corey Clement touchdown reception because I think that one is just black and white. Like I think that one is really obvious. Unless that, unless from what I'm seeing, it's not actually what the ball was doing. Like maybe the referee's got a better a better judgment of the ball or a better view of the ball, and it actually wasn't moving as much as I think it is. I don't know, but but we, we won't know. But I think that so I'll give the referees a you know one one out of two, fifty percent ain't bad I suppose. But the game itself was very exciting. Um, as far as the halftime show, the halftime show, I thought, was... I'll give it a meh. I'll give it a meh. That's the best I can do. It's a simple meh. Um, not a huge JT fan. I loved NSYNC when I was growing up. Obviously, NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, and Britney Spears were all blowing up when I was little. And I was their demographic, you know, like just some elementary school kid. And NSYNC was awesome. Uh, Justin Timberlake's solo career is a little... It's just not my kind of music, that bubblegummy pop. A friend of mine compared him to Usher. And it's kind of the same music where it's just this... I don't know, this really candy-coated kind of poppy music that's just... It's not... I don't think it's for me. You know what I mean? Like I, just, I just think it missed me. And not to say it's not good music. I think Cry Me River's fine. Like some of, some of the songs are fine. They're fine. Relax. It's just not my favorite. I would never YouTube or Spotify JT. Uh, the 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 show, his halftime show, was all over the place. As far as like he was moving from set to set to set, and he was doing a lot. I mean, he was playing the piano, he was dancing. There was, there was a ton of people involved, ton of sets involved. Uh, Prince projector was involved. And then we, they had they had like the Prince symbol outside of the stadium, which I thought was really cool. Now, the production was cool. The you know the dancing and all that stuff. I can't imagine how hard it is to do one of these halftime shows where you have to sing about 15 songs. You have to dance. You have to move all over the place. There's so much happening. You know, you're staying on cue and, and all that stuff. And I've, in my opinion, it was a weak, relatively weak halftime show. Um, it was. It's just like it was like a six, like six out of ten. It wasn't awful. Wasn't great. And. You know, could it have been better? Maybe. How could it have been better? An NSYNC reunion. That's how. How did NSYNC not get involved in this? What the hell is, is Joey, Chris, what, what are they doing? Lance? What are y'all doing? Just one song. If Bye 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 hits, that place goes bananas. Right? Place goes nuts. There was a lot that could have happened, I think. Um... A lot of the times, Super Bowl halftime shows, they are there's so much happening that it really helps if like one star comes out and hell or you know, show like guest appearance. I mean, you saw it with Bruno and Beyonce and all of them, and Justin had a lot of potential people. We potentially could have seen Janet Jackson, which I don't think they would have ever done, but that could have been a thing. Britney Spears obviously could have thing again. I don't know why they would have done that, but bringing out like Britney would have been interesting. Um, the NSYNC reunion, I think, is the easiest thing to do, is to bring out those guys, because, no offense, but I can't imagine they're too busy. It's like, you know, Britney Spears. So if you bring out the NSYNC guys, that would be the biggest moment, maybe, of the night. That that one little reunion. If they do a bye-bye-bye or an NSYNC medley, kind of in the middle of what Justin was doing, I think they could have done that, and you never know, with egos and all that, how it, you know, how it really plays out, or how they want it to play out, so... You know, that, that's, that's not for me to say, I guess. But I thought it was all right. I thought it was all right. I, I didn't... was not my favorite. It was not my favorite. If you're a huge Justin Timberlake fan, 
you know, maybe maybe I'm seeing it differently because I just am pretty met on him anyways. So then the whole performance was met. Uh, commercials, as far as the commercials go, the winner for me was the Amazon commercial, the Alexa commercial. I think Cardi B is so damn funny. I think Cardi B is hilarious. And the whole commercial was awesome. It was it was exactly what you want in a Super Bowl commercial, you know, huge stars, being funny, simple idea, creative, funny script, well written, all that stuff. I thought that was the best commercial. You know, with Anthony Hopkins doing his thing and Gordon Ramsay was really funny and Cardi B's always really funny. So that to me was the best commercial by far. Um, I will have a video this week about the Dilly Dilly, about Bud Light and my take on the whole Dilly Dilly thing. Uh, it's reached a, fi a fever pitch in my life now and it's ruining my existence. So we're going to talk about that at length uh, later on in this week. So be on the lookout for that on the channel. We're going to slowly wrap up this episode. Uh, the Super Bowl, you know, because I, I like to keep you all for about 30 minutes on these shows. I don't want them to get too long because we put out multiple a week. If we put out one a week, you know, we could stretch this to an hour. But I don't expect you all to listen to, you know, two, three, four hours of a podcast vodcast. It, that's hard to ask anybody. So that's why these things are kind of shorter. Um, but the game... Great ending to the NFL season. It's always good to see someone else win. You know, people talk about New England always winning and the same teams in there. I've never been a huge fan of parity. I've never been a huge fan of the idea that every team should be really good. I do like having good teams, you know, like consistent good teams with consistent good players. I think if there was parity, such as, let's say, like, you know, Minnesota versus Jacksonville, it's like, I don't want to watch that game. I would much rather watch the Patriots versus a team like the Eagles, you know, kind of the underdog versus the elite NFL teams. Um, people that are hating on the Patriots, I just don't get it. Um, I have this argument all the time because of LeBron James. I'm a huge LeBron James fan and supporter. And, you know, he loses a lot of finals, but he's in the finals. You know, someone has to lose. Tom Brady threw for 500-plus yards. Didn't I mean, he didn't have a bad game. Him fumbling, you know, he had 505 yards, three touchdowns. He gets sacked, sacked, and fumbles, and now apparently people are, you know, saying he should retire. Tom Brady did everything he could to win this game. Everything he could. The defense was the issue. Uh, Philadelphia played an amazing game, I'll say that. I, I don't think, I think Philadelphia deserved to win. I think they showed so much guts with so many calls. Peterson, Peterson approached this game the best way you possibly could. If you're, you know, playing the Patriots in a big game like this, a one game where you've got to win, put it all on the table and go down swinging. People don't do that against the Patriots. So I think Philly deserved to win. I think it's one of those things where it's not like the Saints-Vikings where Minnesota just didn't deserve to win that game. It was just kind of a freak, awful accident thing that cost New Orleans that game. I think Philly, I think Philly deserved this one. Um, Tom Brady losing this game. His third Super Bowl loss, who's 5-3 and three now in Super Bowls. I don't think that is, does anything to his legacy. I think his legacy is just as incredible. Um, he couldn't have done anything else. He could not have done anything else in this game to, to win in the game. You know, think about the fourth down plays. Just like I said, before the Ertz completion, they had to complete a fourth down play where, where Foles had to, you know, dodge a sack and then complete a pass for, for a first down. If he doesn't do that, the Patriots probably win. Uh, there's a bunch of missed tackles in the game. The, the, the Patriots defense was just not good. Uh, and I think that's where the Patriots need to, what they need to address moving forward, not to mention Brandon Cooks going out. So Cooks going out is a huge deal, obviously. It, you know, it's a huge threat, and that allows – Cooks being out allows the Philadelphia defense to key in more on Amendola, more on Gronk. It's a whole different ballgame. So I think the Patriots – the Patriots team – wasn't as good as Philadelphia's team. The defensive line, offensive line, Philadelphia, I think, was better. I think New England was really, really good, or much better in important positions. They were much better at quarterback. I think Brady, obviously, is a much better quarterback than Nick Foles. And having Rob Gronkowski, probably the second-best player on the field, that's what pushed New England to that 
favorite. You know that that's why they're supposed to win. And and those players did everything they could to win. It was just the defense. And we've seen New England teams in the past kind of have. Yes, they have Tom Brady, but they also have an incredible defense. Um, they didn't have that tonight. They had no sacks on Nick Foles. They had one interception that was just kind of like a tipped ball that wasn't a defensive thing. It was just almost almost luck and happenstance. But this wasn't a great New England team, um, which is hard to say since they went to the Super Bowl. You know, thirteen and three went to the, went to the Super Bowl, could have won it. And I, I don't think this I don't think this affects Brady. I don't think this affects Brady at all. People. A conversation I have all the time with people is, would you rather have a player win five Super Bowls, five for five? Would you rather a player, you can answer this in the comments below or on Twitter. I would love to hear what y'all have to say about this. Would you, would you rather have a quarterback who goes to five Super Bowls and gets five wins, or would you rather have a quarterback who goes to eight Super Bowls, has five wins, and loses three? The answer to me has to be, the five and three, because the guy who went five and zero, oh, yeah, he went five and zero. Oh, but there was also seasons where he didn't go to the Super Bowl. The guy who went five and three went way more times, and that's that's the LeBron James article. That's the that's the Tom Brady. Like would the LeBron James argument, not article, but like Joe Montana is four and zero. Oh, Brady's five and three. I think I think the five and three is way better. Way better. Even though you lose, to get to the Super Bowl by itself is an incredible, incredible achievement. People get lost in that all the time where, you know, Brady is 5-3. and three, Montana's 4-0. and oh. Well, the, the seasons that Montana wasn't in the Super Bowl, he got eliminated from the playoffs. It's almost like getting eliminated from the playoffs earlier can help your legacy versus later because the number isn't always there. You know, if you if you included the years you got bounced in the playoffs, just like Michael Jordan, like yeah, Michael Jordan won, you know, every finals he was in, but he wasn't in one every single year that he was in his in his career. So sometimes he got eliminated from the playoffs, but you don't ever hear about people talk about that because the number isn't associated like that final number, right? Tom Brady's five and three, Montana's four and zero. Oh. That that zero is kind of a, it's kind of a little asterisk next to that zero because. Yes, it's a zero in the Super Bowl, but there's like first round losses in there, second round losses, you know, NFC, NFC Championship game losses. It's a little different, something to think about. But I don't think this, this does anything to Tom Brady's legacy. I think he's still the best to ever do it. I said probably three years ago or so that Tom Brady not only is the best quarterback of all time, not only the best football player of all time, but he should be considered more of a, he's better at his sport than Michael Jordan was at his sport. And that, if you want to see my top uh, conversation on that and my arguments for that, um, go on the YouTube page. And if you go down, it is still up. It's on an Out of Bounds episode, and I think it's titled something like, Is Tom Brady Better Than Michael Jordan? So you can go and check that out. I made that argument a long time ago, and I'm seeing now a lot of sports personalities making that argument. So appreciate y'all watching. Appreciate y'all uh, taking, my, taking my content, guys. But I hope you enjoyed it. This episode, we're going to wrap this up. This episode was a little all over the place because we had to discuss a lot of stuff immediately after it happened in a short period of time. So thank you for sticking with me with this. Um, again, if you if you are listening on audio, I think it would be great for you to go over to YouTube and watch it while we look at the plays picture in picture. It gives you a really good idea of kind of how we're seeing those plays, how we're seeing those catches, and if they actually are catches or if they're not catches. So thank you guys for enjoying this content and sticking with me. If you stuck with me to the end, my God, you are incredible. 40 minutes of Super Bowl breakdown, broke down commercials, halftime shows, the game itself, the controversial plays. Who else can do that in 40 minutes than the king of content himself? Thank you very much, guys. We are pumping out a lot more content. I think we've made a effort this year to really blow it out. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And I've been really proud of the content we're pushing out. Um, that it's one thing to have it's one thing to be to have a strong opinion on something, but to put a lot of effort into a video and make the video entertaining also, just like the Fighting Irish video we made last week. I could have just been sitting there talking about it, but you know, putting a little extra effort into the editing and stuff like that. Yes, it takes more time, but it makes a better product, and I'm proud of the way that some of these videos are coming out. 
And it's an exciting time for what we're doing. And I thank each and every one of you for your support. It has been a blessing. So thanks, guys. Let me know again. Please let me know about any of these topics if you agree or disagree. One thing we are all about on this channel is conversation. All about it. I don't expect nor want any of you to fully agree with me all the time. I am totally cool with differing opinions. So let me know via Twitter or in the comments section or whatever. The Twitter is at J-S-K-R-M-E-T-T-A. J, just the letter, not J-A-Y. So thanks, guys. I will see you later in this week. Have a fantastic... Uh, how, are we not, how is it not a holiday, the day, day after the Super Bowl? If you're going to work, this is a great way to kill some of the work day, kill the commute, enjoy this. But if you're at this point, you already have enjoyed it. So, moot point. Thanks, guys. Again, I'll see you later this week.